Um, I'd like to introduce Bill Strandberg. Bill is one of our members, and he has actually been organizing this event for the past three years. Bill? Thanks, George. Uh, first off, thanks, thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks to Loyola, and uh, thanks to the panel. I'm going to come back to you in a second, and I notice we are waiting. Uh, there's Sarah now. This is Sarah Saratsky walking in. She's one of our panelists. Um, tonight's event is on women in international leadership. Uh, we want to look at uh, what, what the realities of women in the workplace are today. We want to look at it historically, but more importantly than anything else, we want to answer what your questions are. Uh, you'll notice on the desks in front of you, there are note cards. Um, what we want you to do is write questions down. And uh, I'm going to be wandering, and Dorothea there in the back, Dorothea, you want to raise your hand, uh, will be wandering around as well. Um, when you have a question that you want to write down and, and you want answered, pass the, wave your finger, make eye contact with myself or with Dorothea, we'll collect your card and we'll pass it to Mary Ann. Uh, and then she will filter your, your, uh, your questions into conversation to the panel. Um, and we'll kind of get, go from there. We, we view this as an organic, uh, an organic conversation. We don't so much want to preach to you about the topic, we want you to participate with the panel and ask your questions. Um, with that, I'll pass the, the microphone to uh, uh, Mary Ann McGrath, uh, who is our moderator this evening. Actually, I have a, you have a microphone. Yes, I have a microphone. Uh, I'm Mary Ann McGrath. I'm a professor of marketing here in the Quinlan School of Business at Loyola. Um, I have a job that allows me to wander the world, and I just got back from Berlin last night. I've lived and worked in China uh, for three years, and you know, been just about everywhere in the world. So I guess that's why um, I'm here tonight as your panelist or as your uh, moderator. But uh, the important people are sitting here on my right, and they are an incredibly distinguished and experienced panel of people who know about this topic. So. Um, I think the first thing we'll do is have each of them uh, give us about a two-minute introduction to their backgrounds, and then we have some questions for them, and you have some questions for them. So um, why don't we start with um, Richard? You want to begin, and we'll just kind of move along here. Sure. I'm Richard Guha, and I actually am Chairman Emeritus of IERG, but as with everyone else in, who is an IERG member, I do have a lot of international experience. I've uh, lived and worked on 10 countries in four continents and 10 cities in the United States. I uh, have spent a lot of that time, obviously, working with women in various management roles. And I wouldn't say just, it's been primarily management, but in other leadership roles as well. And I've seen, actually, a fairly substantial change uh, in women's acceptance, particularly outside the West, but even in the West, there has been a change. I think the challenges are clear to people, but I think it, it's actually the future is, is very promising. When I first went to university, I went to Cambridge University in England, the ratio of men to women was 10 to 1. And I was a member of a group where we were trying to increase that ratio. and. For the last several years, it has now been pretty much 50-50. And it is gender blind in terms of acceptance and whatever. And I think that has improved things dramatically. And of course, that rep that's important because it represents the leaders of tomorrow. Because the same is true in other universities throughout the West and even universities um, in, in Asia and Africa as well. In many, in fact, many what we would call developing countries um, the women are actually taking very important roles at universities and are becoming the leaders of the future. So learning how to deal with that, learning how to be successful in that, and the men le learning how to do it in many cases, I think okay, is very important. Okay, thank you, Richard. That's really helpful and a good introduction. Um, Gail, do you want to tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, I am the principal of Gail Golden Consulting, which is a management psychology firm. My background is in psychology. Uh, Canada and got an MBA, so I use psychology and the business knowledge to help companies attract, retain, develop, uh, make the most of their senior leadership talent. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit of a uh, poser for being on this panel. I did live 25 years outside the United States, but it wasn't across the ocean, it was across the lake in Canada. Uh, <laughs> 
I've been thinking about that and what that means, because Canada truly is a different country, but in some ways it's very subtle, and so that makes it all the more complicated in some ways. I certainly worked a great deal coaching and working with global companies and global executives. I certainly have spent a fair bit of my career working with women in executive roles, challenges that are specific to women. I'm looking forward to talking about all of this with you tonight. Perfect. Um, I'm just going to, before, um, before Sarah speaks, is everyone able to hear uh, with the microphones? Yeah, you may have to move the microphones a little closer to your mouths on this. This is the, the acoustic, this is a beautiful room, but the acoustics can be very challenging. So uh, we want to make sure everyone can hear what everyone is saying. Okay, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about your background? Sierra Saratsky, born and raised in Lima, Peru. I'm an import. I do have a, an American passport. Uh, was transferred by Marsh McLennan Companies when I was 25 years old. My son was one year old, and my entire career has been with Marsh McLennan, 47 years. I'm a managing director in Chicago, and my specialty is manufacturing companies in terms of risks and exposures. I attended two universities here to get MBA, a master's, one Kellogg for an MBA, and then I went, didn't have enough, so I went and got another master's in financial uh, markets and trading from IIT Kent School. So I am delighted that I have been invited, and I am thrilled that I know Valerie from IWF and Gail from a work experience regarding the Chicago network. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, all right, now before we have Valerie speak, if anyone in the back is not hearing the wonderful things that our panel has to say, just kind of raise your hand and give me the high sign. So I know this is a challenging room. Okay, Valerie, tell us about yourself. I try to specialize mainly in um, but my passion around women and women's global level. Trust me, back then. <laughs> Maybe that was, but um, from there I continue to build and mentor. Um, I was with Mastercard worldwide, uh, head of their sales officer, responsible for the sales. That I was able to meet all the various women in our build a women's leadership network around the world. Um, when I retired in 2000, Global Fund for Women, the largest. I took that as an interim position so I could build the leadership within the organization and then find my replacement. And then I um, started my own company. Okay, thank you, all of you. Um, why don't we just start um, this time with Sarah on the other end of the table and kind of begin to think about you know, what do you think the challenges that female leaders face today in the global business environment? So, Sarah, you want to take a couple minutes, just two minutes or so. I know it's a lot of challenges, but um, you can start and then the rest of you can add to it so that you don't have to cha um, echo what Sarah's already said. As I was thinking about the topic and as I was thinking about today, I came up with, like, some areas where I have personally used 
in order to succeed. You know, I was born in Lima, Peru. My father was Jewish. My mother was Christian. So, you know, lots of different, I have an accent. So I, I jot down three major things. One was education. Second one was culture. And the third was experience. So what do I mean by that? So if I am going anywhere that I don't know, I need to read as much as possible so that I'm well versed with the area, what's the surroundings, what are the people saying. And the word culture, which is my number two, means different things to different people. The culture of Peru is very different to the culture of the United States, just like it is very different to France or Japan. So in order to do business in any of those countries, we need to know how are we going to be perceived and how can we be flexible enough to make the other person comfortable. If I want to succeed in business, that's a selfish thing, right? So for me to succeed means the other person has to accept me and how am I going to do that? So the culture is the understanding of the language, the words, the dress code, the accent, the behavior, you know, the bias. Where do I come from? Somebody from Peru working in Chicago doing business in Japan. How does that look like? And, and when I talk about the accent, here's the thing. People were looking at me and saying, well, you said you came from Peru, but that's not a Peruvian accent. Well, what does a Peruvian ac accent look like? And what does a Peruvian <laughs> person look like? So I, I realized that I had to be experienced on something. So I started, you know, education is something that will help us become trusted advisors. I went to Kellogg, I went to IIT. It resonates that you are somebody because those schools are very picky on who gets there. So I use education to support the experience. Now I work for Marsha McLennan who happens to be a $15 billion insurance broker around the world chances are that some people may have heard of us. So that also helped the platform. So I come to Japan doing business for an American company, <coughs> but born in Peru. I have to have this whole platform surrounding me to be credible, to be accepted, to be at the same table and you know that the culture in Japan is very, very different. We have to always be ready for the unknown. And that's where the research help us how to react if there is an uncomfortable situation that presents itself while you're trying to do business. So again, it's all about research, it's all about experience, it's all about understanding the culture, and it's all about learning where you're going. Excellent uh, summary. Uh, Valerie, do you wanna, what would you add to that with respect to you know, what are some of the challenges? Yeah, I come from personal experience. On being a woman, it's differently around but the thing that helps me not only with what especially to men around the world is what is your personality? The fact that I had a very senior company went a long way when I met <coughs> with people um, and I have to be honest, I, I always had a good relationship. They viewed me as a woman. And 
very important is you need to shy away and say, oh, well, they don't want to meet with me. I'm like, forget that. I know my business. I know what value I bring to them. And I think that's very important. And what's the value add that you're bringing to the table? Importantly, how is it going to create a better relationship Oh, thank you, Valerie. Very helpful. Um, Gail, what would you like to add to that? I think what I have to say in some ways <clears throat> intersects with what has been said already. It seems to me that women leaders, whether here in the United States or anywhere else on the globe, have three basic problems that we have to solve. The first one is authority, establishing ourselves as powerful voices that have important things to say that are worth listening to and following and that we can have influence. And that is a huge challenge, whether we're here at home or in other places around the world. So that's number one, authority. Number two is something that we're probably all a little uncomfortable talking about, but it's all over the news right now, <laughs> sexuality. The fact is that when people work together, they often will have sexual awareness, interest, attraction for each other, and how we handle that in the workplace, how we deal with our own sexuality, how we deal with the sexuality of the people with whom we work, is a crucial part of the navigation of being a woman <clears throat> in an executive role. The third one is balance, and that has to do with our family responsibilities, our marital responsibilities, the kind of personal life that we want to have. And again, I think this is a challenge for women executives everywhere, but when it comes to global leadership, I'm going to uproot my family and take them halfway around the world. I'm going to expect my husband to leave his job and follow me halfway, or we're going to live in, you know, cities apart for a while. These challenges are particularly acute for women who are working. Those are the three buckets that I tend to think about in terms of challenges for women in this arena. Now, very thoughtful. Um, okay, Richard, we're not having you um, represent all men in the world, <laughs> but um, if you would like to add your perspective, we'd appreciate it. Sure. I, I think, you know, interesting listening to all these comments. Um, they're all absolutely valid and absolutely true, and I wish I weren't coming forth, so I, I can't repeat them. But I do think one of the things which is important, uh, and perhaps more important for women because of the circumstances, is to have support. And when I say support, I mean support from their company, uh, from their family. It's interesting, I know the comment which, which you just made, Gail, which was interesting. I know a number of women who've had international transfers and trailing male spouses. Uh, and it's actually the trailing male spouse has to have a fair bit of courage to go off and do that. Historically, it's been much easier for the woman to go and, and perhaps do volunteer work or a part-time job for a lot of the husbands it's difficult, so they have to be supportive and understanding of that. The company has to be supportive. They have to make sure that the woman has the kinds of structures in place in the company. Uh, and I know it sounds silly, but many, many years ago, I actually started off as a chemical engineer, and the year, they weren't, uh, uh, when, I, when I was at university, there were no women doing chemical engineering until the year afterwards, and I remember, the question came up, well, you know, why don't you have more women doing chemical engineering? And I remember some professor or something had a really stupid comment, which, well, there aren't any ladies' rooms on chemical plants. Um, I mean, it sounds now totally silly, but the fact that he was an educated person who could say that, the fact is that the environment, and I don't just mean in terms of, of, of uh, restrooms, needs to be in place to make women feel comfortable is important. You don't want to set things up so that it's difficult for them and then blame them because they're having a problem um, dealing with it. So companies need to be supportive. Uh, I, I think people need to mentor generally. But by the way, I think young people as a whole these na days need mentoring. It isn't only for, for, for women. We, we live in a world where there's far less structure in corporate training and development and promotion. People change jobs. Uh, but I think it becomes particularly important when a woman is, particularly if she's new into 
a role in a country which perhaps isn't f uh, totally accepting of women in leadership roles, there needs to be that kind of support. Um, so I, I think the generally under the heading of support from other people, companies, individuals, family, um, would be a, a head headline for me on that. Okay, well we've talked about some of the um, challenges that women face. Um, what are some of the opportunities? Or what do you see as, as clear opportunities for women in the global environment? Uh, someone want to start on this one? or I, do yes, I, have to call? I, I don't want to have you sitting there thinking, you know, it's like she's going to call on me, you know? So. <laughs> I can start quickly. Okay, I have just perfect. one point to make, which is that as I watch women who are ambitious and who want to move into large scale leadership having international experience is one of the important aspects of that in many cases. That, that somebody who has lived and worked abroad and done so successfully, it's kind of like, you know, having, having a job where you have a P&L. I mean, these are important steps that are part of becoming a human being. Opportunity presents itself. If that's the direction you want your career to take, grab hold of it with both hands. Opportunity. Um, I think as far as opportunities, as most um, well, they should recognize that I know that I have international experience. Why would they know? Sometimes I manage, you know, thousands of people. I try to know as many as I can't get to everyone. I always say never assume the man are in what you can opportunity. Especially when it was I would remind my boss what I did for him lately. How I was the one who helped close that big sale that gave you that huge bonus you got last year. You know, so it's, and you know, they would just laugh at me, like, really? You're telling me this? I said, yeah, because I want you to recognize my talents. And I want to be rewarded in the same way. And it's not, you know, I think you have an opportunity to ask for the promotion, the opportunity, the job you want to have in the international. But for me, I have a lot of international experience, but I never left the United States. I've been to 68. But... I'm saying I never physically left my home in the United States, but so there are ways to have international experience without having to live. So, so here are some of the uh, ideas that I came uh, with. The, the opportunities are to make a difference. You're gonna be differentiating yourself by having international experience. You're gonna think differently, or at least I think differently, when I see people from other places and their point of view. I increase chances, or I increase my chances, to, be, to become senior leaders in global organizations. So I move from Peru to Chicago for a global organization who recognizes different cultures so I fit it very well with them. To learn how to work in different cultures and becoming a success. So I can say, I was 25 years old when I came from Peru, and I have been here with the same company 47 years. There is something to be said about being with the same company for 47 years. How about to increase our wealth? If we know more, if we become more marketable, our paychecks are going to be higher. How about being 
recognized as a global leader, not just someone who is in Chicago, but who has global experience. How about opening markets? Or to learn and teach. When you go to another country, you're teaching some of the cultures of the US. You're learning the cultures of that local country. What about understanding the goals and objectives or someone who is in a different situation as you are? You can import or you can export products, but there is a difference. If you import, you have a support here in the US. If you export, you need the support from outside the US. I could go on. I wrote like 20. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Um, Richard? I think one of the things that, despite all the challenges which women face in leadership roles, I think actually the opportunities are dramatically better than they were 10 years ago, which were dramatically better than they were 20, 30, 50 years ago. Uh, it used to be the exceptional woman 50, 100 years ago who'd persevere through the, the, the challenges which faced her. Um, that now are ladies' restrooms and chemical plants. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, in a bigger way, I think, for example, at Valerie's point, it is actually far more acceptable now for women to be assertive. By I don't mean <coughs> rude or aggressive, but to be assertive in reminding your boss what you've done than it used to be. Um, you know, it's fascinating. There's been a number of things which come up about the code breaking and the Second World War. Uh, whether it was the Bletchley people with Aaron T Alan Turing or the code breaking here in the US. And, and I think one of the th things that's come out, of course, the hidden figures thing with NASA, is that women were working in the background and they had to stay in the background in order to be allowed to keep doing it. Uh, I don't think that is true anymore. I think it is totally legitimate, permissible, and, and encouraged by most people for women to actually say, hey, look what I did. That's great to do that. If you can do that now in a broader range of cultures than you ever could before. As I said, even in, in the, what we would regard as developing countries, it is amazing the highest percentage of female legislators is in Rwanda uh, these days. When you look at some of the places where women have achieved leadership positions, you look at Liberia, you look at places like Sri Lanka and so on, women have achieved leadership positions in business, politics, etc. And I think the opportunities are very good just by being yourself. You don't have to suppress yourself anymore. Uh, and, and that's, I think, wonderful that you can just behave the way that seems natural and tell people how good you are because, and people will recognize it. They won't get upset in most cases. And if they do, then the hell with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this is an interesting. Um, Question from the audience. Um, in your opinion, is there a place in the world where you feel gender does not create a challenge or a difference in doing business? No. I don't think there is. And I think if we pretend that is the case, we are up in the same way that people say, I'm not a racist. Everybody's a racist to some extent. Gender is one of the fundamental ways in which we define each other, and to pretend that we don't notice that or that it doesn't make a difference is more a very important factor in human relationships. Okay, any other comments? I would say from a practical perspective, of course, my personal experience There's always nuances to how it's done, when it's done, timing, <coughs> by sent in before. Just so you have to know and understand the customer, you have to know and understand the culture. Because, yes, you're a global organization, but you have to deal locally. So I do think. Probably does come in there somewhere. I personally haven't. A 
but I've also planned ahead of time. I prepared, especially if I knew probably would have caused issues because of the dominated area. For sure. But as a woman, you also yourself in the most positive situation. Try to create those situations. The, the fact that people may have bias and they may not like women doing business is something that in my opinion goes both ways. Men may not know how to deal with women and women may not know how to deal with men. So having some support, having some people to help you out will go a very uh, long way. So let's explore the US for a moment. I came as a woman, there's no question about that, but I had other things that can help me. If you're dealing in sales, which is what I have done all my career, you find someone who may think you are his daughter and he wants to help you out because he thinks you have a chance and he is there to help out you might find bad people and then you want to stay away from them. But there are a lot of different people and good people. When I did business outside the US, I never went by myself. Number one, either I went with people from the US or I used my office in those places, whether it's Australia, whether it's the UK or France or Bermuda, or Venezuela or, or Japan, I always ask the local marsh office to come with us to help us what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. I remember very early on, we went to dinner and there was an opportunity to dance and the client asked me if I wanted to dance and I said, no, I am here to do business. He said, I respect that. So I just think that there are ways and I, to, to deal with the situation, and I think we can still be winners. May I add on to something that Sarah just said? I think one of the crucial things you said is that it's very unlikely that you can do this alone. And I think there are two parts to it, and one is men help us. Men can mentor us, men can protect us, men can support us, men can encourage us to do things that we don't feel comfortable. I really want to focus on the, the help and support that, that men provide to most of us who have made it in the world of business. The other part of it is we can help each other. Women can help each other. Two years ago, I wrote something called the Sisterhood Code. It's a set of intentions that women can have about how we're going to treat each other. If you're interested, email me, go on my website, I'll send you the sisterhood code. Because we, we're not gonna make it all by ourselves. We have to help each other. We have to turn to our brothers and our fathers and our colleagues to help us, but we also have to help each other or we're gonna keep getting stuck in the same place. I mentioned that, Sarah, because I think it's critically important. I think actually that's a, a change uh, a generation or so ago what I saw there were, when there were very few women who made it at the top, they tended not to be very good at helping other women. And I think that I see that as a huge change in the last 20 years, that women have un understood and accepted that helping each other helps them as well. That you don't have to, I, I think again, the idea that I made it so you're gonna have to go through the same kind of thing as me isn't valid, but it used to be around. I think it's dead, I hope it's dead, because that doesn't work. And by the way, men have lots of help too. Uh, men help, uh, you know, the men's clubs, the fraternities, the stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff there which men get help with. I know people who, who rode for Ivy League universities, and guess what, they get job opportunities afterwards, which aren't open to even to men who haven't rode for those places. 
So those kinds of things, what we're seeing, I mean, your point about is there a difference? There's a difference. It doesn't necessarily have to be a disadvantage. And I think one always hears that the country where the greatest degree of equality is in is Iceland. But even there, there are differences. And Norway and places, that some of the Scandinavian countries, there's a tremendous amount of equality. Equality does not mean the same. And people have to use what they have. Uh, there are uh, situations, social, semi-professional situations, where you can learn, you can build friends, get mentors, do that. And again, it's, uh, women could not survive without sympathetic men as well. Um, and I think increasingly we're finding women are mentoring uh, the younger, uh, younger men. I think the level of that gender blindness is not disappearing. It won't. But the fact that people are willing to look to some extent, the 25 and 30 year olds, will look at people on their own merits more than they ever did. And that's a positive thing. Okay, I think we all agree that gender does matter. <laughs> and uh, we're not going to run away from that. But um, so the, another question from the audience is, what industries or disciplines do you think have the, lar the greatest opportunities for young women? Valerie, you want to think about that one? Pipeline. So, uh, not only on the board. Problem for them becomes one organization. So it's building those support systems and that. Um, the good news is years ago you had to be a, a teller at the bank, had this lower level role. Well, now. You could be a you could be the CEO. Really, basically, whatever you want. There's a lot of um, industries that are more, if you will, geared toward women still. Yeah, but I've noticed, especially in the field of medicine and nursing, far more women doctors than there's. Healthcare field is more, but I would say, from my own perspective, finance and economics, those are to me. Also, areas that up the ladder. Not that everyone wants to be in corporate, I happen to love corporate, but I also work with a lot of having those those help you in your small business. So I like lists. So here are my lists. I think you can be successful in any profession that you look for, as long as you have passion, perseverance, and looking at the future as a positive way to succeed. The selection of education needs to be based on a return on investment. So don't go into an education that is not gonna help you succeed. Choose the right career to be successful. The right career is for you because it might be different for me. You, like, like Valerie said, you gotta drive your own career and make your own future. Belong to professional organizations and learn from them. Become familiar with recruiters 
because they are going to help you where the next job is. And no one can help you more than you can help yourself. There is no challenge that you cannot overcome. You can come conquer the world if you have the drive to do it. Yes, I will be happy to go next. And since I'm told I have to get closer to the microphone, I will do so. Um, two very good points, that you have to find something you have passion for and have expertise in. Um, I find it interesting that I've worked in a number of different industries. So, for example, consumer packaged goods tends to be more friendly towards, more accepting to women than, let's say, um, enterprise software in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is notoriously unfriendly to women. But then there are also functional expertise. If you go to Silicon Valley companies, you'll find that the HR department may be 90% women. Marketing's 50% women. Engineering's 1% women, or close. Um, interesting, I just recently had an exchange with someone who I, I, I mentored us a few years ago when I was in the enterprise software business. And this is a, a, a woman who came from a family of engineers, loved engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, whatever you want to call it. She went to Stanford, graduated near the top of his class, got a master's degree. Um, her brothers had straight up careers in enterprise software. She found she was challenged. Uh, she, was, she was very, very good, but she was having great difficulty getting promoted as fast as her brothers were. What she did, interestingly enough, was go into government. Government actually is an area where there's probably far less bias, whether it's gender or whether it's based on ethnicity than anything else. They are very, very conscious of being fair. So she would join Sandia Labs, which is one like Lawrence Livermore, and one of the top research labs in the world. And she joined that and became head of their supercomputing department at, at Sandia. Spent about seven or eight years doing that. Now you may go, well, why would you do that? Well, what happened was she moved, moved sideways and is now um, uh, president of a division of Intel. So she skipped two or three rungs on the normal career progression in enterprise software by being very thoughtful, by taking a step into an area where gender mattered less, proving herself that way, and then doing something that, that by moving into enterprise software or back into the high-tech business. And, and that's a creative way of dealing with a situation which she recognized. And as I said, she's a very smart woman. And she did it very, she knew she loved technology and computer science. She wasn't going to get out of it. She wasn't going to go into HR or whatever. And yet she managed to have a very successful career by, by understanding what the dynamics were. So understanding what the dynamics are is very, very important. What I've seen, in, in fact, for both men and women who do well, they are very good at understanding the politics and the dynamics. So I think you know, that applies whichever agenda you are. But I think for a, for a woman, it becomes particularly important to understand how to do it. But back again, do what you enjoy doing. Don't do something purely because someone tells you to or because you think it's going to make lots of money. It's amazing how much money you can make in a field where apparently you don't make money. Uh, I, I know historians who make lots of money because they become experts, they write books, they do other kinds of things. Uh, it's amazing what you can do if you really put your mind to it. The question I think, the question I think, is it the woman? The question was about where the opportunities are for women. <clears throat> And I think we have to think about two different kinds of opportunities. Entry level opportunities, where there are lots, for example, in public relations, child care, in personal medical care. Um, and th these are very, all of them, very good, important, and meaningful jobs. They are, however, and easy for women to enter. They are not typically the jobs that are going to get you into senior. Not typically. If you want to get into a senior leadership, well, I would agree with what Valerie said. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, STEM are the tickets to senior leadership. The other thing I would say is have a job where you are responsible for a PL. Fundamentally, 
Those are the paths that get people. So though, and are those opportunities easy for women? Not as much. You have to fight harder to get into those. Are the paths for most? Okay. Well, that kind of the segue to this is also a question that I've had many students ask me in the past, which is that you all say that you need international experience to become part of the um, global leadership. How do you recommend that young women um, in the audience get this uh, global experience? So in other words, what is the path to global leadership as you see it? Um, I don't know, Valerie, you wanna yeah. think about that? One of the, oh, much different. <laughs> One of the paths is um, actually, during your university years is to take, um, if you will, a gap year and to work internationally, um, do an internship. I tend to mentor a lot of women who have done mentorships overseas, and I always suggest you go to a country that's not maybe as well known. Like Lauren, you might want to go to Paris, but I probably wouldn't pick Paris. I'd pick Myanmar or I'd pick um, Zimbabwe or Zambia. Something where it's unique and different, but then hone in on the area of focus. So perhaps if you're you know, a numbers nerd like me, you might want to do finance and, um, you know, banking online because that's, I mean, on your phone because that's the only way they could bank. So find unique ways to do it. So I think experience um, during your university years is always good, even if you can't do a whole year or do a gap year to do at least um, a semester abroad is good. A second way I think is really important is to ask for the assignment if you are within a global company to uh, literally ask for the assignment. Now I think the thing most people forget about, because I had you know, managing people around the world, it always seemed like a great idea for me to send that person um, to Nairobi and they're gonna be there for a period of time and they take their family, everything else. Well, a lot of times what people forget when they take these international assignments is you normally have to come back to headquarters. And I've learned through experience that if I had people that were overseas more than three years, they don't want to come back. So as an employer, you have to kind of take that into mind. And I had to set limits on the time that they would be there. But more importantly, will you have a job when you come back? And it's nice, oh, I have all this international experience but you always have to still apply, interview, and have something to come back to. And people who take overseas assignments often forget that. They just think, well, I did it for you as a company. You're just going to you know, plop me in a super duper position. Doesn't work that way. So about a year before you come back, you need to start interviewing, meeting, coffees, come in to wherever your headquarters is, because that's usually, you usually don't sign up for a company unless you think someday you're gonna be at headquarters, if you go into the corporate world. But the whole point is, is you need to keep your network going even though you are overseas, and perhaps you want an assignment in another country then you need to be networking during that time period so that you have a place to go. So you always want to come home, whatever your home is, but you've got to prepare to get there. So if, if you think of uh, ambassadors, you know, they are going to be outside their host country and always be uh, deployed in a foreign country. So they go to school and learn how to 
be an ambassador and they pass all these exams and they go in that field. So you have to make a decision, like Valerie said, is that what you want? Do you want to go from country to country or do you want to just to have the experience? You can go to college and take some international courses. You can join in the summer corporations that are global and spend a summer learning about what a global company means. You can work from an international standpoint from the USA, like I did. I never lived in other country than Peru for 25 years and the rest here in Chicago. But I did international work from the USA. Because here's what happens. You gotta make a decision. Are you gonna go from country to country or are you going to make your career in the USA where the CEO is, where all the powers are? So you go for three years someplace else, out of mind, out of sight, are you gonna have a place when you come? Or someone else who was there next to the CEO or next to the senior leader is gonna get it ahead of you. So think about those areas when you're looking at, okay, I wanna live outside the USA. I know of a woman who was pretty senior who went to China and didn't last more than three months. So at the end, she had to leave the company because that wasn't for her. So again, a lot of thought, a lot of uh, research, a lot of talking, a lot of reading, and make a decision. If you want to live outside the US and you want to go from country to country, there are plenty of opportunities. But if you want your career here and you still want to have a flair for the international, look for global companies. Make two quick points. Fluent, really fluent in every Learning one language helps you to get more adept at learning others and certainly a plus for international assignments. But I must admit I got my international experience because I started as a trailing spouse. One thing about living in d multiple different countries, I think if you decide that you want to be a professional expat, and there are people who are professional expats, who literally don't necessarily feel they do want to come back to the US. They really don't care where they, well, they care where they live, but as long as there can be a multiplicity. I do know people who that's what they are. They don't see themselves as having a home country. Um, of course, you have to be really good at understanding pension plans and taxation in different countries. But there are possibilities of that. But that is, again, something which is a personal passion. Some people just like to do that. Um, and I, I, I say I know a number of people who do. So that possibility exists, and there are organizations which will allow you to do that. Um, many of the not-for-profits do that. Some corporations do. Uh, I spent 12 years with... Mars Incorporated, which doesn't really have a corporate head office. There is no corporate other than people who fill the ta file the taxes and all that kind of stuff. Or 100% of all the operating jobs are scattered around the world and people move from country to country routinely. So there are a few other companies like that as well. So you just have to be aware of that fact. Um, but I think in general, certainly the validity of if you are moving, if you're being sent out from headquarters, Retaining connections to, uh, uh, to to the headquarters and and other key people is really important, and you have to work at that. Uh, I suspect that with LinkedIn and electronic communication, it's easier than it used to be. You don't have to jump on a plane to come home every few months. Every time you've got an excuse, just to smooth smooth in the corridors. Um, but those connections as a whole have to be kept going. And when you're dealing internationally, I think that makes it it makes it much more incumbent upon you to take the initiative to do that because other people won't necessarily do that that much. Okay, thank you. Um, another interesting question. How do you walk the fine line between being bossy or coming off too strong and being perceived as too nice? It seems to be a very narrow line. I'd like to respond first because there's a wonderful book Karen Harris called Breaking Through Bias. Address this exact question with um, 
decide that I, I, I wish I had written that book. Talk about the, the, the Goldilocks syndrome, not too big, not too small, just right, which is what you're talking about. And basically they have wonderful anecdotes and guidelines for how to navigate some of these tricky situations. Um, there's a lovely story at the beginning of the book about a young woman lawyer who's just been put on a, a big account. And, and she's walking into the room, the client's in the room, his back is to the door, and her name, she's, she's actually one of the authors, Andy Kramer, Andrea, but she goes by Andy. And the client is saying, you mean Andy is a girl? I can't work with a girl. Walks up to him, she smiles at him, she says, you know something? and I just got off on the wrong foot. I'm gonna go back outside and I'm gonna come in again. Back in, walked up to him, smiled, held out her hand and said, hi, my name is Andy Kramer. And they got on just fine after that. Mm. I'm not saying that will work in every situation, but it's the kind of light touch that I think is key to navigating those kinds of potentially very Breaking Through Bias by Kramer and Harris, I highly recommend it. I had a similar situation in banking, uh, walked into the boardroom, there was all men, I was the only female, we had just merged with another bank, and I walked into the room and the gentleman at the front of the room who was uh, the senior person, he said, oh, Oh, Valerie, what a lovely suit you have. I love that color. And I, I could have like been offended, everything else. And instead, I just walked right up to him. I shook his hand and I said, John, that's the loveliest tie I have ever seen. <laughs> and everyone started laughing. And from that day forward, everything was fine. So it's like, don't get too uptight about things. Uh, this nice versus being too aggressive. I like to use the term assertive because I think that's very important. Is that, you know, don't, you don't need to overwhelm people with how smart you are and how bright you are. And you could be nice to people, but at the same time they know that you're bringing your authority with you, your, um, you're exuding your own confidence. That's really what it's about. And the one thing I have have found over the years is if someone, sometimes, you know, a guy or even a woman will say inappropriate language in a meeting, I would never call them out in the meeting, but they would be the first one I see in the hallway and I'd pull them aside and say, let's just meet in my office, close the door, and say, I'm really disappointed. That was really inappropriate language to use in a professional setting, and you offended me. End of story, I never bring it up again. But it also shows that you could be kind and nice and bring to people's attention things that they could have done perhaps in a different way without being nasty about it and I think you can I think the most important thing I found in my advancements in my career as well as my roles around the world has been to be a nice person to really truly have a genuine concern for people to I know all my clients I knew who their families were um, you know, I've known, heard about their children from the time they were born. I might never meet them, but I can tell you something about them. So I think it's building those close personal relationships without being personal. You have heard that there is a difference between being passionate and being emotional. Yes. So normally, People from South America, in particular, they are passionate. Italians are that way too. You know, they they speak with their hands and they, you know, they they talk loud and you know, my voice carries and and whatever. So um, 
when I am in a meeting and I know this passion and emotional, I start by saying, I'm passionate about this, I'm not emotional. So I set the stage right away uh, about my point of view, that it is passion and drive, not that I'm bossy, which there's nothing wrong with being bossy, as long as you have your um, support behind what you're saying. I compliment men about their suits. I do. I mean, there are some guys that wear unbelievable suits in meetings. And I say, can you tell me where you buy your clothes because I wish my son would dress like you? So if somebody compliments me on a suit, I kind of enjoy that. I don't feel offended. Like Valerie said, chill out. Somebody says the wrong thing in a meeting, Men and women are both trying to figure out how to deal with this newness about women in the workplace. Some men, all they saw is their mother at home being supportive. So we have to always think that what goes through our mind goes through their minds. And what they say instantaneously, automatic, oh, I have to deal with a woman or, or some other thing, is because of their bias, their background, where they were born. I could hurt if somebody, men or women, say things that triggers my childhood. You know, I grew up in Peru. My father was Jewish. My mother was Christian. 99.9% .9 in Peru at that time was Christian. I had a Jewish name. I mean, I thought Shylock was a name that I was proud of until I really, really read Shakespeare. The, I think it's called the uh, Venice. Merchant of Venice. Venice. What is it? The Merchant of the Venice. The Mer Merchant of Venice. And I realized that Shylock was trying to make a profit out of everything. And yet the people in school called me Shylock. And I loved it all my life. It wasn't until I came to this country that I realized, oh my God, I don't want to be called Shylock. So, you know, we need to learn, but men and women, they are both in the same boat. They were never taught to be different. All they saw is their parents, their people in school. There's a lot to learn on both sides of the equation. We need to learn, like Gail said, sexuality. There's no place in, in, in work for women to try to flirt with a boss when you are at a Christmas party or a holiday party. You know, you don't flirt anymore. But women had to learn that too. And men had to learn that too. And there are a lot of companies that they don't know if they want to have holiday parties. They are afraid of the alcohol. They are afraid of a lot of things. And early on in my career, I said, no alcohol. I don't want to be there. Because when people start drinking, they go the other side. Whether it's a man or a woman, they forget. So I say, positive, positive, positive. Give the benefit of the doubt. There is a lot to learn but it's to learn on both sides. I think one of the key things is to know yourself and the culture you're in. So even when we talk about whether you use humor, whether you take someone aside to talk to them, knowing what you're good at is important. Some people are very good. They have the kind of mind which can be really, say, just the funny zinger and everyone laughs and it's diffused. Other people aren't, but they can be very good at being sincere and taking someone aside. Know what your own skills are. Know, again, what's acceptable in the culture and what isn't. I mean, the interesting thing is the most common place people meet their spouses these days is at work. So to say we're going to take out sexuality from the workplace is not going to happen. 
Now, again, those are typically single people, etc., unless someone's married and gets divorced. But, um, but the reality, again, there is a right way to do it. The office party is usually not the right way to do it. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so, again, setting those constraints of behavior, understanding the culture of the company, understanding how you can do it. You always want to come across as being professional in everything you do. And so that you're, you're human beings, you interact as a human being, but very much using your personality, your humor, things like that are very, very important, even if you have to practice them. I mean, it's interesting how I know people who will say something which seems hilariously funny and totally off the cuff and on the spur. And then a little bit later in a different situation with a different audience, they say pretty much the same thing. And you know, they have a little repertoire of things which they use to say. And they have figured out that if I have this repertoire of things, I can pull out from my toolkit whatever I need to say. Uh, and I think, again, it's important to think through that kind of stuff. If I'm in this situation, what are the kinds of things I can, I can do? Now, Valerie's quick-witted. Most of us can't be that fast, so let's rehearse it if we have to. Um, and I, I, so I, and, and again, someone also made the point. Most people are well-intentioned and themselves are a little bit confused. They're not quite sure if they've hurt your feelings or not. Um, and they're sort of embarrassed. They say something and it's like, should I have said that or not? That happens a lot. That happens. Men and women will do things like that now. So again, being sincere in your reactions is really important as opposed to acting and either ignoring it, which is bad because then it'll continue, or overreacting to something, which is bad. So being somewhat natural, understanding your style and how to react to it and, and, and thinking it through ahead of time is good. I want to get off the topic, but I want to talk about the office party for a minute because I have made a lot of money I've been paid by companies to coach business executives who have gotten them into themselves into trouble at office parties. They're valuable to the company, but they are also huge risks. They put the company at legal liability for saying and doing stupid things at office party, and it's my job to straighten them out. I've gotten to be pretty good at it, actually. But I will say, this is danger zone, because it's a professional function, like a social personal function, and there's alcohol. And I couldn't agree more with what Valerie said. If you do not drink at professional almost all of the risk that you're gonna do something inappropriate at those parties. Drink soda water, because those are danger zones. I, go ahead. Well, now, one thing I wanted I don't know about office parties because I don't drink, but um, so I, but it is, I've seen people, their whole careers have been ruined. Yes. You know, we were in Vienna, Austria, and supposedly someone was at the bar all night. She fell off the bar stool, and within a year, she's out of the company. And it does, your reputation uh, is does mean something. Richard was talking about being yourself. I think um, probably the vernacular we use is being an authentic leader, right? Knowing what you're good at, knowing what are the areas you need to personally improve in, but always be yourself. I wouldn't probably handle things the way anyone on the panel handles it. You know, we'll all handle it in our own way, but I think the important thing, what all of us that have been in business for a long time have been in the working world, is you learn who you are. And so the authenticity is really very important. I wrote someplace in my notes that we should stay away from alcohol, tobacco, and the water cooler gossip. <laughs> oh, the gossip, yeah. So here's the thing. Um, when I was growing up in this country, basically, because I came at age 25, I joined women professional organizations. I'm a member of the Chicago Network. I'm a member of the Chicago Finance Exchange. And I learned how women relate to women and how women help women. So I learned that. But as I was moving 
up, I realized I needed more. I needed the in interaction of men and women. I needed to learn how this happens. And I was looking to become members of organizations where both men and women are members. So I joined the Economic Club of Chicago. I joined the Chicago Club. I joined where I could see the behavior of a man and the behavior of a woman and the, the interaction of both. We need to look up and look and look and look because this is foreign for all of us. This is foreign for all of us. But it's our responsibility to educate ourselves and to know in advance what to say or what to do when there is an inappropriate scene or behavior or, or somebody who is drinking. I leave parties when the, the alcohol is being served. I just immediately know that's the end because that's where the trouble starts is with the alcohol. Okay, well thank, thank you, all of you. Um, we have a, from the audience, we have a question that I guess is a comment, which is much good advice, but most applies to men as well, is the question. But now I wanna get granular and say another question. Is there an accepted dress code for, glo uh, for women globally? What, um, what's related to clothes, makeup, nail polish, et cetera, is less more? Have you seen changes in that ex uh, accepted dress code over the years? I would like to say the following, that you gotta research. You gotta research and you have to be yourself. But whatever you do, you cannot offend the host country. You cannot offend the host country. You have to find out what is acceptable. When I go to New York, I dress in blues and blacks just to be safe. I, we went through a phase of suits where we look like men in suits, but now we're going through our own authentic, blah, 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 being authentic. And women are now wearing dresses without sleeves and with a jacket. So the dress code is research, research, and don't offend. I would agree. I don't think there is one standard globally. I think there are societies in which you offend, and there are societies where if you wear pants, you offend. Having said that, I think there are a couple of basic rules that work in most places, one of which is cover your bosom. And when I'm coaching women and they come to me during the workday and their bosom is visible, I will talk with them about the fact that that is likely undermining their authority. And while that's very important authority when you're home nursing your baby, it's really not something that you need to be bringing in. So I think there are some fundamentals like that that make sense. Women need whether they're dressing for a nightclub or whether they're dressing for work and whether they want to be seen sexually. Our dress communicates with us. But again, in terms of cultural norms, very different from one place to the other. And absolutely. And by the way, one company to another. Different companies. If you're working in a creative firm versus working in a law firm, one of the rules I think which is great is look at the women who are one level above you in the firm and dress like them. Yeah, I, I agree and they, it's always interesting. I remember uh, someone I know who went to interview with a Silicon Valley company and dressed up for the interview. Senior mm -hmm. job, vice president job, dressed up. Got jewelry, dress, everything like that. And literally, they came, while she was sitting in the lobby, someone came out and said, to her, go home, go away. Literally, you don't fit. Now, the key always, again, is if you're going for an interview, one notch above the norm. So if everyone's wearing jeans and T-shirts, you don't wear jeans and T-shirts, but you don't overdress. And equally, again, if you're going for a cosmetics company, 
you bet you put on lots of makeup and jewelry and things like that, because if you look sort of slovenly in those situations, you, they won't hire you there. So, so the culture of that company, the culture, and again, very much, it's very noticeable. You just walk the streets in Paris versus walking the streets in, in, in New York. Women dress differently. There are certain norms you have to understand and, and, and fit into and be aware of. So again, I totally think that do research. I do have a, a nail polish comment. A friend of mine who was very senior executive in a major corporation, uh, Italian background, and she talked a lot with her hands. She said, I'm, I'm committing a sin here. Do not wear bright colored nail polish because people will follow your hands and not pay attention to your face. Her advice was to, to, to women wear nail polish wear a pale color so you don't distract people with that purple stuff that you're waving around in the air. I do think it's um, different for everyone, but normally my client is a bank or finance company, so they tend to dress more in suits. Uh, dresses, like Sarah said, with a jacket. But of course, if I'm in Saudi Arabia or whatever, I'm going to wear a veil. And I'm always respectful. But no one, you also have to think about who your client is, because they don't expect me to be any person on the street. They know I'm coming from the United States. They tend to give you a little bit of a grace period you know, to fit in. But um, one of the most important things is to, you know, you're, you're part of a global company, but you have to think locally. And you have to present yourself locally. So this research and my understanding protocols in um, Japan, for instance, if someone handed me their card, I hold it reverently. I put it down right in front of me, I rub it a few times while they're talking, it shows that I have respect for that person. I would never be a typical American, throw it in my purse so I don't forget it, right? So, um, but they're not expecting me to come in a kimono either, right? So I think give yourself some slack, but do your homework understand what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Um, and in Paris, I have to say, and in France, some of the women, they come in very low cut dresses and things like that, and I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, that would never go in the United States, but for them, that's what they're used to. Doesn't mean that's what I'm gonna do, but I could do a version of it where a dress, you know, like a v-neck like this yeah. rather than down farther but it's roll with the flow like I don't get too hung up on it but in your own mind you should be professional covered I do a lot with University of Connecticut students and uh, they're going for job interviews you know they've got the skirt up to here and the you know I knew <laughs> let's start all over let's get to a normal length, you know, tell me about what's the position, what are people wearing, you know, so check, check it out first and do your homework. I would add the following, that when you're doing business outside the U.S., you want to do business. You don't want to be an activist. Right. So you don't want to get into the politics. If women don't drive in certain countries, we're not going to criticize that. That's not what you are there for. You're there to do business. You're there to get a document signed and get the money for whatever it is you are there for. So staying out of criticizing the country, criticizing the culture, and just centering to why you are there is the best way. Do your business. Be respectful. The other person doesn't know how to deal with you either. So it's, it's two-way street. And the winner is going to be the one who makes the other person comfortable. 
and the one that comes back to the USA with the contract signed. Okay, well, great. Um, another issue about the workplace environment, interesting question. Ad agencies, media companies, and tech companies are known for their fun culture. Um, you know, things going on, uh, whoa, what's this word? Oh, jeans every day, kegs in the office, and um, happy hours. Is this hindering, this is a, your opinion, is this hindering the professional development of young professional women? And should companies do away with this? I can take it. I'm just saying, you gotta be authentic. If the company gives you a cake, you don't have to drink it. If the company has a ping pong table, you don't have to play. You can just be there and be yourself. So it, 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 it's all upon you. You want to be friendly? Be friendly, but don't flirt. Don't go with low cuts or, or anything that might be considered inappropriate. You cannot change the world and create rules. The companies are trying to find ways for people to interact, but it's still up to you how you handle those scenarios. And sometimes it's tricky because they can be putting yourself in a situation that you don't know how to handle. That means you cannot be the next leader. So watch out for those things. You are there to do a job, a good job, and to be friendly. But you don't have to drink, and you don't have to dance, and you don't have to cross the line. You have to be yourself and just accept what's in front of you, but just, you know, watch out. A few years ago, I was consulting to a sales team in a large electronics uh, firm. And they had a party at a bar one evening, and they had a ring with suits. A wrestler by putting on one of these gigantic fat suits, and then getting into the ring and bumping into each other until somebody falls down. The sales team, by the way, were all men. They were all consultants, myself and another woman. And they really wanted us to get in our fat suits and hop in the ring and do this sumo thing with them. Well, there was no way on God's green earth that I was going to put on one of those things. First of all, I mean, who else has worn it? It's sweaty. Secondly, you're like, come on. So finally, I said to them, look, do you have any idea how hard we work to not look like that? <coughs> we are not going to put on those suits. <laughs> and then they laughed and left us alone. So it's, it's these, these work-related fun things are a challenge because on the one hand, you do want to yeah, go with the be flow, a be a it. fun person, be part of it. That's part of the culture in many of these firms. But again, these are these high-risk gray zone situations. Again, I would emphasize drink little or nothing, it is okay to say no to a, an activity that you're not comfortable with, like putting on a sumo suit. And um, it, I think, you know, my quick answer about the, the question is, yeah, everyone else is wearing jeans. But the kegger, I'd be careful about that part of it. No, it's interesting. Uh, having been in the enterprise software business, it was, there was this sort of almost area, this part of the zoo, where the software developers would work. They'd be working in cubes, and they'd often, they'd usually have mattresses there, so they could work through the night, because they often did. They'd bring in loads of beer and pizza, and they would work through 48, 72 hours <laughs> of quite, frankly, repulsive area. Everyone else would stay away from that area. Um, and there were women working there, not very many, as we've said, but not very many. And most of the women didn't participate. I mean, there were limits. There's this, the smelliness and the, everything was pretty unpleasant. The raucousness, the everything else. But you know, the reality is, it, 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 it did, quote, hurt them in that they were regarded as being standoffish and whatever. Ultimately, what had to happen was that the management, who had been very complacent about the whole thing, 
some of the women and some of the men, some of, not men working there in general, but some other men said, you've got to stop this. This cannot happen. And so it became the responsibility of the management to say, you can't do this. Yeah, you can have parties from time to time, but you can't party throughout your, your daytime and drink beer and eat pizza and yell obscene comments at each other and so on. And, and they did clamp down it a lot. They didn't totally eliminate it. But it, became, it only happened because people had pointed out to the managers, because the managers of these developers had grown up in the same environment. That was normal to them. So someone, and say mostly the women, but also a few men from other departments, had said, you've got to stop this. So when something like that happens, when there's behavioral stuff or, or ways of behavior, I mean, I, I agree. Everything we've said about alcohol, stay away from it. Absolutely stay away from it. And by the way, the sensible guys stay away from it too. It, it does not help. Um, and, and, but making sure that people realize that certain kinds of behavior in certain industries are particularly bad at that and certain functions are particularly bad at that. But you need to, need to speak up. And that's, again, where the assertiveness, not aggressiveness, but just being able to speak up and say so is important. Well, my nickname at MasterCard was Pollyanna. <laughs> And uh, the guys used to say that to me, because I just have never drank anything, never smoked a cigarette in my life. There's no, I don't know why I never did, but I never bothered. So, you know, we'd be at functions for the company, beautiful events, you know, there's liquor, everything else is going on. I just didn't engage. But they would call me Pollyanna because, oh, you're so good, and I didn't go for their dirty jokes and all that other stuff. But I always, for myself, I needed to prove myself through my work, right? That, and I ended up getting more promotions than they got and all these other things, but it's because I kept my head to the grindstone. I promoted myself. I was assertive with my colleagues, with my boss. I networked with the CEO and all the senior people at the company. And so you find your own way. But that's my authentic self. Doesn't mean that's the path you're going to take. But it's just knowing myself. I could care less you call me Pollyanna. Let's see in the workplace, and let's see who's going to you know, bring the most profitability to the company, who's going to lead the best teams, those kind of things. So for me, the competition was important and invigorated me. So you could call me whatever name you want, but I want to win in the field. I have three sons, and one of the things I noticed when they were growing up is that they called each other, and their very good friends, terrible names. That this was part of the friendship that these mm -hmm. boys had. They said the most yeah. awful things to each other. Yeah. Is sometimes a way that men it's, show It's an affection. Exactly. Yeah, because they're like my brothers, and yes. I still stay in touch with now, them that all the time. Mean you have to put yeah. up with obscene or, no, or, no, no. or obnoxious. But if a guy calls you a nickname, including very well be that it's his way of saying, hey, yeah. we're comfortable and we're friends and, mm -hmm. and you're yeah. in the club now. That's true. So you, you need yeah. to watch out yeah. for that. I'll tell you that uh, some of our students refer to me, my classes as the wrath of McGrath. So, <laughs> and I'm OK with that. <laughs> Okay, well, we've been talking about um, corporate contexts uh, for the last hour. So um, what advice do you have for women starting their own business or entrepreneurship versus the uh, large corporate environment? Uh, which aspect? Just in general? I think in general, the question is, um, what, what, maybe what advice would you have for them in order to be successful or things to avoid? Okay. I work with a lot of um, women entrepreneurs around the world, and the first thing is that 
I try to help them make sure that they have confidence in what they're doing and not to make <laughs> excuses for something. Like they explain, explain, explain. It's like, no, just do it. And if they think you've done something wrong, they'll ask you a question. So first of all, no excuses, ladies. Uh, just do your thing. The other big thing is to know financials. So many women start a business, lost a business, very successful businesses, they lost it because they didn't know the financials. They let someone else take it over, explain to them, well, they're not explaining it properly, and people come in, take over all your stock, take over your shares of the company, and before you know it, you're out. And you're the one who came up with the idea, you built this. So it's very important um, to know your business, but the biggest thing that I see as a pitfall for women is making excuses for why they didn't get things done on time, get things in. It's like either you're in this or you're not in this. It's the same advice I give to a man. Is either you're passionate about what you're doing and you're gonna devote the time and attention to it or don't do it. And that's really been a major um, flaw, if you will, that I've seen and again, not understanding the financials. There's some broad-based research that has shown that the businesses, small businesses started by women survive, more so than the small businesses started by men, but the small businesses started by men that survive grow faster and bigger than the ones that women start. And it has to do with risk profile. That we are cautious, and that's why our businesses don't fail, but we want to take the risk that it takes to grow them. So I think, you know, you need to think about going in, into running your own small business. What is your goal? Is your goal play it safe and keep your business small? Nothing wrong with that. Or is your goal, you know, the next Facebook? In which case, you're going to have to take big risks. Um, and, and I think there's, there are both pluses and minuses to the way, now obviously it's a generalization. There are women with huge risk profiles and men who are very cautious. As a whole, that seems to be a difference in how, how the, the story of our business is. About it as a woman. The um, women may not have access to investments like men. Uh, maybe men have better networks than women do, or maybe they have advisors that they may not pay for, but they are just volunteers. The key is you need money to grow your business, and you need to pay advisors, people who know finance, people who know human resources, whatever it is, you are going to need money for that idea, and you need to figure it out whether the small business agency, whatever they, they call it, SBA or something like that, uh, can give you some money or whether you're gonna mortgage your home, but you cannot grow if you don't have enough funding. And so um, it, it's, it's all about how you want that idea to grow and who do you want to market it to so that you can help, you can get the help that you need to launch it, keep it, and grow it. I, I, I spend most of my time these days working with startups. I, I actually have a role with the state of Connecticut where I give advice to startups in Connecticut because they don't have any money and they don't necessarily have the experience and they need help. The reality is most small businesses fail. So let's put that into perspective. Women may have, women also start more small businesses than men do. Many reasons for that one, uh, sometimes because their spouse will support them while they do that. Sometimes it happens the other way around, but, but more likely that the, the male spouse is supporting the, the, the female spouse. 
Um, women also often they're, they've uh, got good business experience, they go home to have kids, they get bored, they can't quite go back to full-time job, so they start off small businesses. I know several people who are doing that. I, I think the points we've heard before about funding is, is a, women have it, there's no doubt, much tougher to get funding than men. In fact, the interesting evidence is that even women venture capitalists are more likely to invest in men than they are in women, uh, which is kind of interesting that that perception is still there that a lot of women's businesses may not be completely serious, so they have, think they have to be. I think the other thing is there are networks slash resources specifically focused on women or at least oriented more towards women, and women who are starting up a new business need to f sort those out. Uh, they need to find what are the best ways of getting funding. They need to treat it very professionally, in a sense even more so than when you're in a corporate environment, initially enough. Um, because so many people in st the startup world are dilettantes. You really have something to prove. By the way, again, male or female, but, but woman, a woman may have a bit more. The idea of getting advisors, professional advisors, who know what they're doing is good. And it's amazing how many people in the startup world assume that they're entitled to free help from someone or other. And, and it always fascinates me as to people sort of, they feel that bestowing a great honor on you is like, <laughs> we'd like to make you our advisor and we're going to put you up on our website. Wow. <laughs> You know, I mean, we, we all have faced this sort of stuff, and it's like, not really, because if I, if I don't know you that well, I don't believe you, A, you can actually hurt my reputation if you're, I'm up on the website and you go belly up three months later, particularly if there's some obvious reason why you failed. Um, I, I think that it is important to have some form of compensation. Okay, you don't have money now but have something where you're going to say, okay, I'm going to put money in escrow for when I get a certain level of funding, or I'm going to give you stock, stock options, et cetera. Com complex, but in some way or other, make sure that people feel an obligation. Because otherwise, by the way, even if you do get good advisors, after a while they're going to lose interest in you because you're going to hurt, you know, you keep on, oh my gosh, that person's asking for free advice again. I don't have three hours to spend on the phone. And we've all had someone who spent three, wants to spend three hours on the phone thrashing through some decision. And you're sitting there going, why am I doing this at 11 o'clock at night? Um, so I, and I, I, financials, that by the way is true again. Of, so many of these things are true of men and women, but I think women in a sense have a bit more to prove because there's an assumption even the part of women VCs, bankers, bankers very much assume women don't understand finance. It's quite amazing how that happens. Um, and again, we go back to the code breakers in the Second World War and all that kind of stuff, and it's complete nonsense. Um, and people, again, actually don't realize when computer programming first started, most were women, because they're the only ones who could type. For men, it was beneath them to type. Um, so th I, I think dealing with it professionally, understanding the numbers, getting, putting that professionally as well. If you have an advisor, make sure there's some compensation. Uh, taking advantage of, the, again, the people who, there are a number of groups, if someone's particularly interested, I can give you lots and lots of lists of, women, of groups that will help women. Um, and, and, and doing that very seriously, because if you're going to be successful, I always say you've got to be crazy to do a startup, because it is difficult, and you have to be prepared for the fact it's difficult, you've got to have perseverance, you've got to have energy, you've got to have drive, you've got to have control and command of what you do. One thing that's um, interesting, women versus men in uh, startups, is that women tend to underestimate how big their company could possibly be, which also throws off investors. Because they're saying, that makes no sense. You need, you probably need a lot more money to get that thing going and off the ground where a guy will go in with a much higher amount that he needs and the investor is discounting what he said. If he said, I need a million, yeah, he probably needs about 500,000. But a woman says, I need a million. They're thinking, no, she really needs two million. So that's why the numbers are so important, but it's also, creating relationships, 
and creating your own networks. Um, if one of the boards I'm on is a solar lighting company, so that's consumer product. You have to be able to, you know, I'm doing solar lights, but what did I do? I went to get with um, Alan Hassenfeld of Hasbro Brothers because he knows plastics. So it's always making these, creating these relationships that can help you build and grow your business, but to Richard's point, also not taking advantage of people and being thoughtful to thank people along the way because I find everyone wants me to mentor them but very few ever remember to say, oh, by the way, thank you. I appreciate the fact that you took, you know, 50 hours out of your life for my company. So those kinds of things are important, too. Uh, and by the way, just to build on that, research has shown that men tend to overestimate their abilities. Women tend to underestimate their abilities. So any guy you talk to will talk about what a genius he is and blah, blah, blah. You talk to a woman and it's, well, I've got some skills at this and some skills at that. Uh, and I think, you know, women have to learn, if they, particularly if you're going to be in a startup, probably more than anything else, to do that. Because when you talk to, a, to an investor and you say, we're going to be a $20 million business, they will scale it back. So the guy's going to go in and say, we're going to be a $40 million business. The investor says, that probably means only a 20. And the woman goes in and says, well, I'm being really cautious. I think it's going to be a $10 million business. The, the investor is going to scale it back to five. So you have to understand that whoever you talk to is going to scale it back. So you better be optimistic. Not unrealistic, but on the high end of the realism, which comes harder to most women than, not all, again, there are always exceptions, but you've got to be able to understand that people are going to scale that back. Okay, now to an issue that is, um, you know, started as maybe a women's issue, but I think it's a human issue. How do you manage the balance between the workplace and your family and life outside of work? 25 words or less? Less, <laughs> yes. Preferably less, yeah. I've stopped using the word Partly because I think it's illusory about balance and, and struggling with it. And partly because any balance that you find is going to last about 10 seconds before your kid gets sick, your husband's tie is keep, he can't find it, or whatever the case may be. I like the concept of managing your energy. Out, number one, how to live your life in such a way that you have as much energy as possible by sleeping, eating, time with people who nourish you. That, I think, is, is hugely important for all business leaders, <laughs> women and men. As much as energy as you can, conscious decisions about what matters the most and spend rather than letting it get frittered away by that really aren't that important. So it's an input-output kind of equation. How do I maximize my energy and make thoughtful decisions about how I'm going to spend it? And that changes. What I was going to spend my energy on was very different from once they were all out of the home, and, and then I could travel a lot more for business. I've come up with the concept myself that I think is wonderful because I invented it, called curating your life. About the same way that you curate an art exhibit, you put some paper on it. And what are the things that are important up and in front of you now, and what are the ones you're going to put in the basement? Those are the concepts that I use rather than balance. I'm sorry, are some of you having trouble hearing me? I'm doing my best here. Uh, that's what I. Uh, that, that's what I would say about balance. And by the way, there is no one-size-fits-all formula. It is absolutely a conscious adjustment, re -curate. I would like to add that there is no stigma attached to being stay-home mother or stay-home father. There are opportunities to work from home and raise a family. Corporations are offering both 
maternity leave and paternity leave because they want to be equal and they don't want to favor one over the other. There is more awareness about equality. There are opportunities to get help at home. You don't have to do everything at home. You can get somebody to come to your house and clean or do your errands or um, do the cooking or pick up the kids from school or whatever it is, you need support. You don't have to do everything yourself. And you have to figure out where is the most valuable place for you to spend your time. Time is limited. So do the best of where you need to be at. If you have a family with little kids, try to be near work. So don't go to Lake Forest if you work downtown and you have a two-year-old and a three-year-old. Get a condo a mile away so that you can go there at lunchtime and have lunch with them or maybe take time to go and, and uh, be with them during their softball or soccer or whatever it is. Companies are more flexible in terms of letting employees go out for an hour or two to be with their kids because they know they have to do it themselves. They are also fathers, they are also mothers, and they have to be with the kids when they have their games. So right now with the smartphones and the opportunity to work 24 seven, you can take time and be with the family and then do the work before you go to bed or when you get up at four o'clock in the morning. But the idea is you don't have to do it at all. You have to structure your life so that you can be able to be a good father, a good mother, and have a good job. Fathers are staying home to allow women to go back to their jobs so that they don't miss the opportunity to grow in the business. So now there is paternity leave and maternity leave in some companies to promote women to go back to work. Sarah, I, I really agree with what you said, except I think I have to disagree with one point. There is stigma to taking time off work for both women and even more so for men. There is clear research home for a while, that is going to affect your salary and your promotions for the remainder of your career. I mean, you may be able to overcome that, but it's, it is. That's the reality. Now, having said that, I think it's hugely important that we do it. Our kids and our families matter. But I think we have to accept the fact that there are professional consequences. Oh, an hour off is, this is, is that not? I'm glad to hear that because my voice is usually very loud. Um, so yeah, it's uh, certainly not to take an hour off, but if you take even a month off, the, the statistics show that year over year, it ha accounts for some of the, gap, the wage gap between men and women. So. That's, that's what I've seen, and feel free to push back if you disagree. Well, I'm not gonna disagree, but one of the things I wanted to add is several companies are starting um, on-ramping, off-ramping. So if women are going out on maternity leave, they call that off-ramping, so they're getting prepared for whoever's gonna take their position, take their place, but then they're continuing an on-ramping program where these women and men still get together on a regular basis, once a month minimum, 
and they get together, they talk about the positions, they talk about the work that's being done, et cetera, so that they're not losing any of the opportunities that might be arising. So you could also look for organizations like that. In general, uh, if you're married, if you have a partner, if you're in a relationship, I hate to tell you, but you both have to be on the same page. You have to be able to help each other. There's times where my husband's business is like this, times my business is like this. You know, there is no balance, because sometimes he's here, I'm there. You know, it just that's just the way it is. But at the end of the day, as any loving parent, you want what's best for your child, right? And what's best for your family. So if you think you're gonna be able to do it all and have it all, you probably can, but not all at the same time. So you just accept that and move on. And I don't think it's, when I see our daughter and son-in-law and the, my grandkids, and how they are with them. They both work full time. They both travel all over the world for their jobs. They're all very busy. But those kids are loved and you know what? It doesn't matter. They might be home on the weekend, but they spend the whole weekend with the kids. So I just think it's your personality. It's how you wanna do it and how you wanna play the game. But at the end of the day, if you aren't satisfied all of us would say the same thing. If you're not personally satisfied, how can you give back to your family? It's very difficult. The definition of work-life balance, I think everyone's addressed it, and it's, it's really confusing. Because, you know, I, I love my job. I loved my work all my life. If I didn't like it, I'd do something different. And to me, the thought of spending two or three hours on the golf course is like worse than torture. It's like, <laughs> I played golf for two years and retired in disgust. I felt I should play it because everyone else seemed to. I really detested it. That would not be work-life balance for me. Um, so I, I think you have to bear in mind what's right for you. Different people have different preferences. Uh, some people would much rather work at, again, it's not because they're sitting there trying to audit an account and they're counting thing, but because there's an intellectual challenge in it, the stimulation about being business. I've always found, you know, the age of 12, I say I fell in love with two things, was technology and business. And I still find them both absolutely fascinating. They're fascinating from every point of view. And I think whether you're male or female, if you really want something and you in, enjoy it, do that. Don't feel, I, it's, every now and then people f say you have to do this. And again, you know, it's interesting, when Marissa Meyer was, was running Yahoo, which had very, very enlightened policies for parenting and maternity leave. The first thing she did was, when she had a baby, was build a nursery next to her office so she could come back to work famously after about a couple of weeks. She got a lot of flack and a lot of criticism. And I, I sort of understand why, because she certainly was passing down the wrong message to the women who worked, or even the men who worked for her. But nevertheless, it's something she liked. Um, I, I remember once someone telling me that oh, you know, you shouldn't come into work early, too early and stay too late. And I went, why? Because all your people feel compelled to do the same thing. And, and that's tr probably true. So be aware of the kinds of signals you send. But work-life balance is not a magic formula. You just have to work out what's right for you. And if you want to play golf, then fine. You know, I do know people who manage to play golf while supposedly working. You know, they'll be taking clients out or whatever. I mean, even presidents have been known to do that. Um, so, so it is an individual thing, and, but you may have to make some compromises in some areas in order to get there. And so long as you understand that and are prepared to make it, that's fine. If you really want to maintain your scratch golf, and I hate to keep on bringing up golf. Let's say you, your tennis ranking, USTA tennis ranking, you want to maintain it. Uh, and, and you're prepared to do a little bit less work and advance a little bit more slowly or change careers completely, fine. Okay, well, I want to, first of all, thank our, as we wrap up, um, our audience came up with some wonderful questions. 
and some of them have individual questions for panel members. So I want to thank you for your thoughtful questions and your listening. Uh, before we completely finish our evening and give you some time to talk to each other and to our panel members, um, I thought each of our panel members might want to say a few closing remarks. Um, if you have anything you haven't gotten a chance to mention yet. No? Stunned silence? Okay. There must be something well, really. One, <laughs> we have to think. One thing I think is really important for women is to be good to each other. Um, I think the mentoring, the networking, the um, the understanding you bring to each other, different times in your life, different things are happening. I think that's really very important. Uh, but at the same time, I beg you to not be a male basher um, because the men in my particular life, I never would be where I am today without them. And I've had wonderful male mentors as well as wonderful female mentors, so, um, and you know what, it's really important to always be curious, to, to listen, to explore, to ask questions, and I think the more you do that, um, to me at least, you're more fulfilled in your, both your work life and your personal life. I would like to say, that we need to refresh our knowledge regularly. That we need to listen to great leaders tell their stories. To read biographies of great leaders. To ask for what you want to do next. Do not allow negativity to ever enter your mind. Be positive 100% of the time. Be brave and conquer the world. Mm -hmm. I would like to say that I don't think there has ever been a better time or place in the history of the world to be a woman. I think we are freer than our mothers and our grandmothers ever were. And we have a fabulous opportunity to be fully ourselves and to contribute in the, to the world in ways that have rarely been available to women in the past. So go get them. I, I, I second that, and I think it's important what we're talk, talking about is to look back on history. I mean, the reality is it wasn't that long ago women couldn't get a credit card in their own name. They couldn't sign an apartment lease. And, uh, and this is really not that long ago. Women ha didn't have management roles. Um, it was a very much the exception. And this has happened really in a generation. And I think the new generation of women, and I see also the men who go with them, um, are also far more accommodating and happy to help their significant others develop. Um, I mean, e even we talk about all the issues, and it, it's obviously the, the, the uh, elephant in the room, the, the whole molestation and harassment stuff. The fact we can even have those discussions, I think, says a lot. Um, the fact that people feel that this is wrong and that there's a right way to do things. I, I think the future for over the next 10, 20, 30 years for women in leadership globally because uh, it is global, it's not just in the United States or, or Canada or Norway, it's everywhere. I, I think that's a very exciting time for women and ultimately the men in their lives too. It is in the man's interest to have um, significant others or the woman in their life, whoever in their life, to, to, to see that people have these capabilities and abilities and opportunities. So I, I agree, this is a great time. I would like to mention three names. Anna Bissell, first CEO, Bissell Sweeper Company, 1889. Catherine Graham, first female Fortune 500 from the Washington Post, 1972. Ursula Burns, first African-American Fortune 500 CEO, 
2009, you could be the next. Yeah. Well, I want to thank our panel on behalf of the um, audience and IERG um, for your honesty, your openness, your authenticity, um, your thoughtfulness, and the fact that you handled this topic, which is a difficult one, with a lot of gentleness. So thank you. Can we give them a wonderful round of applause? Hey, hey thank you for coming. As Bill is doing that, I'd also like to say thank you very much to a very distinguished panel. I think everyone would agree that we had the pleasure tonight of listening to four executives that have years and years and years of valuable experience, both internationally, business, and thank you very much. And Professor McGrath, thank you very much for moderating the panel. Um, as I said, IERG is open to all executives with international experience, but we are also open to people who don't yet have that international experience. We welcome students, we welcome managers who are interested in breaking into international and their own companies or other businesses. We welcome entrepreneurs um, you know, who are looking to do more international business. So please don't go away thinking that we're a high level group of aged executives who have all worked internationally. We're not. Uh, and we do welcome everyone who has an in interest in international. And for younger people, or for students, grad students, or for young managers, uh, many come into our group and ask us, you know, we're looking for a place where we can learn, where we can be mentored. So we're very open to that. And if you'd like to find out more about our organization, we have a number of members here tonight, including myself. We'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Or you're always welcome to take our card, give us a call. Um, and, you know, we speak to you on the phone about it. So thank you very much for participating tonight. We certainly had a good group, a lot of great questions. Thank you very much. And uh, we still have, you know, um, up till 9 o'clock. Um, you're welcome to participate and have some, we have some hors d'oeuvres and we have some drinks. And it's a good time to network. So thank you again. <laughs>